Section 6 of Animal Heroes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cooper Leith. Animal Heroes by Ernest Thompson Seaton. Badlands Billy, the Wolf that Won. Chapter 1 The Howl by Night. Do you know the three calls of the hunting wolf? The long drawn deep howl? The muster that tells of game discovered but too strong for the finder to manage alone? And the higher ululation that ringing and swelling is the cry of the pack on a hot scent? And the sharp bark, coupled with a short howl, that seeming least of all is yet a gong of doom for this is the cry close in this is the finish we were riding the badland buttes king and i with a pack of various hunting dogs stringing behind or trotting alongside the sun had gone from the sky and a blood streak marked the spot where he died away over sentinel butte the hills were dim, the valleys dark, when from the nearest gloom there rolled a long-drawn cry that all men recognize instinctively, melodious, yet with a tone in it that sends a shudder up the spine, though now it has lost all menace for mankind. We listened for a moment. It was the wolf-hunter who broke the silence. That's Badlands Billy. Ain't it a voice? He's out for his beef tonight. Chapter 2 Ancient Days In pristine days, the buffalo herds were followed by bands of wolves that preyed upon the sick, the weak, and the wounded. When the buffalo were exterminated, the wolves were hard put for support. But the cattle came and solved the question for them by taking the buffalo's place. This caused the wolf war. The ranchmen offered a bounty for each wolf killed, and every cowboy out of work was supplied with traps and poison for wolf killing. The very expert made this their sole business and became known as wolvers. King Ryder was one of these. He was a quiet, gentle-spoken fellow, with a keen eye and insight into animal life that gave him a special power over broncos and dogs, as well as wolves and bears, though in the last two cases it was power merely to surmise where they were and how best to get at them. He had been a wolver for years, and surprised me greatly by saying that Never in all his experience had he known a gray wolf to attack a human being. We had many campfire talks while the other men were sleeping, and then it was I learned the little that he knew about Badlands Billy. Six times I've seen him, and the seventh will be Sunday, you bet. He takes his long rest then. And thus on the very ground where it all fell out, to the noise of the night wind and the yapping of the coyote, interrupted some time by the deep-drawn howl of the hero himself, I heard the chapters of this history, which, with others gleaned in many fields, gave me the story of the big, dark wolf of Sentinel Butte. Chapter 3 In the Canyon Away back in the spring of 92, a wolver was wolving on the east side of the Sentinel Mountain that so long was a principal landmark of the old plainsman. Pelts were not good in May, but the bounties were high, five dollars a head and double for she-wolves. As he went down to the creek one morning, he saw a wolf coming to drink on the other side. He had an easy shot, and on killing it, found it was a nursing she-wolf. Evidently, her family were somewhere nearby, so he spent two or three days searching in all the likely places, 
but found no clue of the den. Two weeks afterward, as the wolver rode down an adjoining canyon, he saw a wolf come out of a hole. The ever-ready rifle flew up, and another ten-dollar scalp was added to his string. Now he dug into the den and found the litter, a most surprising one indeed, for it consisted not of the usual five or six wolf pups, but of eleven, and these, strange to say, were of two sizes, five of them larger and older than the other six. Here were two distinct families with one mother. As he added the scalps to his string of trophies, the truth dawned on the hunter. One lot was surely the family of the she-wolf he had killed two weeks before. The case was clear. The little ones awaiting the mother that was never to come had whined piteously and more loudly as their hunger pangs increased. The other mother passing had heard the cubs. Her heart was tender now. Her own little ones had so recently come and she cared for the orphans, carried them to her own den, and was providing for the double family when the rifleman had cut the gentle chapter short. Many a wolver has dug into a wolf den to find nothing. The old wolves, or possibly the cubs themselves, often dig little side pockets and off galleries, and when an enemy is breaking in, they hide in these. The loose earth conceals the small pocket, and thus the cubs escape. When the wolver retired with his scalps, he did not know that the biggest of all the cubs was still in the den. And even had he waited for two hours, he might have been no wiser. Three hours later, the sun went down, and there was a slight scratching afar in the hole. First, two little gray paws. Then a small black nose appeared in a soft sand pile to one side of the den. At length the cub came forth from his hiding. He had been frightened by the attack on the den. Now he was perplexed by its condition. It was thrice as large as it had been, and open at the top now. Lying near were things that smelled like his brothers and sisters, but they were repellent to him. He was filled with fear as he sniffed at them, and sneaked aside into a thicket of grass as a nighthawk boomed over his head. He crouched all night in that thicket. He did not dare to go near the den, and he knew not where else he could go. The next morning, when two vultures came swooping down on the bodies, the wolf cub ran off in the thicket, and seeking its deepest cover was led down a ravine to a wide valley. Suddenly there rose from the grass a big she-wolf, like his mother yet different, a stranger. And instinctively the stray cub sank to the earth as the old wolf bounded on him. No doubt the cub had been taken for some lawful prey, but a whiff set that right. She stood over him for an instant. He groveled at her feet. The impulse to kill him, or at least give him a shake, died away. He had the smell of a young cub. Her own were about his age. Her heart was touched, and when he found the courage to put his nose up and smell her nose, she made no angry demonstration except for a short half-hearted growl. Now, however, he had smelled something that he sorely needed. He had not fed since the day before, and when the old wolf turned to leave him, he tumbled after her unclumsy puppy legs. Had the mother wolf been far from home, he must soon have been left behind. But the nearest hollow was the chosen place, and the cub arrived at the den's mouth soon after the mother wolf. A stranger is an enemy, and the old one rushing forth to the defense met the cub again, and again was restrained by something that rose in her response to the smell. The cub had thrown himself on his back in utter submission, 
but that did not prevent his nose reporting to him the good thing almost within reach. The she-wolf went into the den and curled herself about her brood. The cub persisted in following. She snapped as he approached her little ones, but, disarming wrath each time by submission and his very cubhood, he was presently among her brood, helping himself to what he wanted so greatly, and thus he adopted himself into her family. In a few days, he was so much one of them that the mother forgot about his being a stranger. Yet he was different from them in several ways, older by two weeks, stronger, and marked on the neck and shoulders with what afterward grew to be a dark mane. Little Dusky Mane could not have been happier in his choice of a foster mother, for the yellow wolf was not only a good hunter with a fund of cunning, but she was a wolf of modern ideas as well. The old tricks of tolling a prairie dog, relaying for antelope, huffing a bronco, or flanking a steer, she had learned partly from instinct and partly from the example of her more experienced relatives when they joined to form the winter bands. But, just as necessary nowadays, she had learned that all men carry guns, that guns are irresistible, that the only way to avoid them is by keeping out of sight while the sun is up, and yet that at night they are harmless. She had a fair comprehension of traps. Indeed, she had been in one once, and though she left a toe behind in pulling free, it was a toe most advantageously disposed of. Henceforth, though not comprehending the nature of the trap, she was thoroughly imbued with the horror of it, with the idea that iron is dangerous, and at any price it should be avoided. On one occasion, when she and five others were planning to raid a sheepyard, she held back at the last minute because some new strung wires appeared. The others rushed in to find the sheep beyond their reach, themselves in a death trap. Thus she had learned the new dangers, and while it is unlikely that she had any clear mental conception of them, she had acquired a wholesome distrust for all things strange, and a horror of one or two in particular that proved her lasting safeguard. Each year she raised her brood successfully, and the number of yellow wolves increased in the country. Guns, traps, men, and the new animals they brought had to be learned. But there was yet another lesson before her, a terrible one indeed. About the time Dusky Mane's brothers were a month old, his foster mother returned in a strange condition. She was frothing at the mouth, her legs trembled, and she fell in a convulsion near the doorway of the den. But recovering, she came in. Her jaws quivered, her teeth rattled a little as she tried to lick the little ones. She seized her own front leg and bit it so as not to bite them. But at length she grew quieter and calmer. The cubs had retreated in fear to a far pocket, but now they returned and crowded around her to seek their usual food. The mother recovered, but was very ill for two or three days. In those days with the poison in her system worked disaster for the brood. They were terribly sick. Only the strongest could survive. And when the trial of strength was over, the den contained only the old one and the black mean cub, the one she had adopted. Thus, little Dusky Mane became her sole charge. All her strength was devoted to feeding him, and he thrived apace. Wolves are quick to learn things. The reactions of smell are the greatest that a wolf can feel. And henceforth, both cub and foster mother experienced a quick, unreasoning sense of fear and hate 
the moment the smell of strychnine reached them. Chapter 4 The Rudiments of Wolf Training with the sustenance of seven at his service, the little wolf had every reason to grow, and when in the autumn he began to follow his mother on her hunting trips, he was as tall as she was. Now a change of region was forced on them, for numbers of little wolves were growing up. Sentinel Butte, the rocky fastness of the plains, was claimed by many that were big and strong. The weaker must move out, and with them Yellow Wolf and the Dusky Cub. Wolves have no language in the sense that man has. Their vocabulary is probably limited to a dozen howls, barks, and grunts, expressing the simplest emotions. But they have several other modes of conveying ideas, and one very special method of spreading information the wolf telephone. Scattered over their range are a number of recognized centrals. Sometimes these are stones. Sometimes the angle of cross trails. Sometimes a buffalo skull. Indeed, any conspicuous object near a main trail is used. A wolf calling here, as a dog does at a telegraph post or a muskrat at a certain mud pie point leaves his body scent, and learns what other visitors have been there recently to do the same. He learns also whence they came, and where they went, as well as something about their condition, whether hunted, hungry, gored, or sick. By this system of registration, a wolf knows where his friends, as well as his foes, are to be found and Dusky Mane, following after the Yellow Wolf, was taught the places and uses of the many signal stations, without any conscious attempt at teaching on the part of his foster mother. Example, backed by his native instincts, was indeed the chief teacher. But on one occasion, at least, there was something very like the effort of a human parent to guard her child in danger. The dark cub had learned the rudiments of wolf life, that the way to fight dogs is to run, and to fight as you run. Never grapple, but snap, 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 and make for the rough country where horses cannot bring their riders. He learned not to bother about the coyotes that follow for the pickings when you hunt. You cannot catch them, and they do you no harm. He knew he must not waste time dashing after birds that alight on the ground, and that he must keep away from the little black-and-white animal with the bushy tail. It is not very good to eat, and it is very, very bad to smell. Poison. Oh, he never forgot that smell from the day when the den was cleared of all his foster brothers. He now knew that the first move in attacking a sheep was to scatter them. A lone sheep is foolish and easy prey. That the way to round up a band of cattle was to frighten a calf. He learned that he must always attack a steer behind, a sheep in front, and a horse in the middle, that is, on the flank. And never, never attack a man at all. Never even face him. But an important lesson was added to these, one in which the mother consciously taught him of a secret foe. Chapter 5. The Lesson on Traps A calf had died in branding time, and now, two weeks later, was in its best state for perfect taste, not too fresh, not overripe, that is, in a wolf's opinion, and the wind carried this information from afar. The yellow wolf and dusky mane were out for supper, though not yet knowing where, when the tidings of veal arrived, and they trotted up the wind. The calf was in an open place, and plain to be seen in the moonlight. A dog would have trotted right up to the carcass. An old-time wolf might have done so 
but constant war had developed constant vigilance in the yellow wolf, and trusting nothing and no one but her nose, she slacked her speed to a walk. On coming in easy view she stopped, and for long swung her nose, submitting the wind to the closest possible chemical analysis. She tried it with her finest tests, and blew all the membranes clean and tried it once more. And this was the report of the trusty nostrils. Yes, the unanimous report. First, rich and racy smell of calf, 70%. Smells of grass, bugs, wood, flowers, trees, sand, and other uninteresting negations, 15%. Smell of her cub and herself, positive but ignorable, 10%. Smell of human tracks, 2%. Smell of smoke, 1% of sweaty leather smell, 1%, of human scent, not discernible in some samples, 1.5%, smell of iron, a trace. The old wolf crouched a little, but sniffed hard with swinging nose. The young wolf imitatively did the same. She backed off to a greater distance, the cub stood. She gave a low whine. He followed unwillingly. She circled around the tempting carcass. A new smell was recorded. Coyote trail scent. Soon followed by coyote body scent. Yes, they were there sneaking along the ridge. And now, as she passed to one side, the samples changed. The wind had lost nearly every trace of calf. Miscellaneous, commonplace, and uninteresting smells were there instead. The human track scent was as before. The trace of leather was gone. But fully one-half percent of iron odor. And body smell of man raised to nearly two per cent. Fully alarmed, she conveyed her fear to her cub by her rigid pose, her air intent, and her slightly bristling mane. She continued her round. At one time, on a high place, the human body scent was doubly strong. Then as she dropped, it faded. Then, the wind brought the full calf odor with several track scents of coyotes and sundry birds. Her suspicions were lulling, as, in a smalling circle, she neared the tempting feast from the windward side. She had even advanced straight toward it for a few steps, when the sweaty leather sang loud and strong again, and smoke and iron mingled like two strands of a party-colored yarn. Centering all her attention on this, she advanced within two leaps of the calf. There on the ground was a scrap of leather, telling also of human touch. Close at hand, the calf. And now, the iron and smoke on the full vast smell of calf were like a snake trail across the trail of a whole beef herd. It was so slight that the cub, with the appetite and impatience of youth, pressed up against his mother's shoulder to go past and eat without delay. She seized him by the neck and flung him back. A stone, struck by his feet, rolled forward and stopped with a peculiar clink. The danger smell was greatly increased at this, and the yellow wolf backed slowly from the feast, the cub unwillingly following. As he looked wistfully, he saw the coyotes drawing nearer, mindful chiefly to avoid the wolves. He watched their really cautious advance, 
It seemed like heedless rushing compared with his mother's approach. The calf smell rolled forth in exquisite and overpowering excellence now, for they were tearing the meat, when a sharp clank was heard, and a yelp from a coyote. At the same time, the quiet night was shocked with a roar and a flash of fire. Heavy shots spattered calf and coyotes, and yelping like beaten dogs they were scattered, except the one that was killed, and a second struggling in the trap set here by the ever-active wolvers. The air was charged with hateful smells redoubled now, and horrid smells additional. The yellow wolf glided down a hollow and led her cub away in flight. But as they went, they saw a man rush from the near bank, where the mother's nose had warned her of the human scent, and saw him kill the coyote and set the traps for more. Chapter 6 The Beguiling of the Yellow Wolf The life game is a hard game, for we may win ten thousand times, and yet if we fail but once, our game is gone. How many hundred times had the yellow wolf scorned the traps? How many cubs had she trained to do the same? Of all the dangers to her life, she best knew traps. October had come. The cub was now much taller than the mother. The wolver had seen them once, a yellow wolf followed by another, whose long awkward legs big soft feet, thin neck and skimpy tail, proclaimed him for this year's cub. The record of the dust and sand said that the old one had lost a right front toe, and that the young one was of giant size. It was the wolver that thought to turn the carcass of the calf to profit, but he was disappointed in getting coyotes instead of wolves. It was the beginning of the trapping season, for this month, fur is prime. A young trapper often fastens the bait to the trap. An experienced one does not. A good trapper will even put the bait at one place and the trap ten or twenty feet away, but at a spot that the wolf is likely to cross in circling. A favorite plan is to hide three or four traps around an open place and scatter some scraps of meat in the middle. The traps are buried out of sight after being smoked to hide the taint of hands and iron. Sometimes no bait is used except a small piece of cotton or a tuft of feathers that may catch the wolf's eye or pique its curiosity and tempt it to circle on the fateful treacherous ground. A good trapper varies his methods continually so the wolves cannot learn his ways. Their only safeguards are perpetual vigilance and distrust of all smells that are known to be of man. The wolver, with a load of the strongest steel traps, had begun his autumn work on the cottonwood. An old buffalo trail crossing the river followed a little draw that climbed the hills to the level upland. All the animals used these trails, wolves and foxes as well as cattle and deer, they are the main thoroughfares. A cottonwood stump not far from where it plunged to the gravelly stream was marked with wolf signs that told the wolver of its use. Here was an excellent place for traps, not on the trail, for cattle were here in numbers, but twenty yards away on a level sandy spot he set four traps in a twelve-foot square. Near each he scattered two or three scraps of meat. Three or four white feathers on a spear of grass in the middle completed the setting. No human eye, few animal noses, could have detected the hidden danger of that sandy ground, when the sun and wind and the sand itself had dissipated the man-track taint. The yellow wolf had seen and passed and taught her giant son to pass such traps a thousand times before. The cattle came to water in the heat of the day. 
they strung down the buffalo path as once the buffalo did. The little vesper birds flitted before them, and cowbirds rode on them, and the prairie dogs chattered at them just as they once did at the buffalo. Down from the gray-green mesa, with its green-gray rocks, they marched with imposing solemnity, importance, and directness of purpose. Some frolicsome calves, playing alongside the trail, grew sober and walked behind their mothers as the river flat was reached. The old cow that headed the procession sniffed suspiciously as she passed the trap set. But it was far away. Otherwise, she would have pawed and bellowed over the scraps of bloody beef till every trap was sprung and harmless. But she led to the river. After all had drunk their fill, they lay down on the nearest bank till late afternoon. Then their unheard dinner gong aroused them and started them on the backward march to where the richest pastures grew. One or two small birds had picked at the scraps of meat, some blue-bottle flies buzzed about, but the sinking sun saw the sandy mask untouched. A brown marsh hawk came skimming over the river flat as the sun began his color play. Blackbirds dashed into thickets and easily avoided his clumsy pounce. It was too early for the mice, but as he skimmed the ground his keen eye caught the flutter of feathers by the trap and turned his flight. The feathers, in their uninteresting emptiness, were exposed before he was near. But now he saw the scraps of meat. Guileless of cunning, he alighted and was devouring the second lump when clank. The dust was flirted high and the marsh hawk was held by his toes struggling vainly in the jaws of a powerful wolf trap. He was not much hurt. His ample wings winnowed from time to time in efforts to be free, but he was helpless, even as a sparrow might be in a rat trap. And when the sun had played his fierce chromatic scale, his swan song sung and died as he dies only in the blazing west and the shades had fallen on the melodramatic scene of the mouse in the elephant trap. There was a deep, rich sound on the flat butte, answered by another, neither very long, neither repeated, both instinctive rather than necessary. One was the muster call of an ordinary wolf, the other the answer of a very big male. Not a pair in this case, but mother and son. Yellow wolf and dusky mane. They came trotting together down the buffalo trail. They paused at the telephone box on the hill, and again at the old cottonwood root, and were making for the river when the hawk in the trap fluttered its wings. The old wolf turned toward him. A wounded bird on the ground, surely and she rushed forward. Sun and sand soon burnt all trail scents. There was nothing to warn her. She sprang on the flopping bird, and a chop of her jaws ended his troubles. But a horrid sound. The gritting of her teeth on steel told of the peril. She dropped the hawk and sprang backward from the dangerous ground, but landed in the second trap. High on her foot its death grip closed, and leaping with all her strength to escape, she set her forefoot in another of the lurking grips of steel. Never had a trap been so baited before. Never was she so unsuspicious. Never was catch more sure. Fear and fury filled the old wolf's heart. She tugged and strained. She chewed the chains. She snarled and foamed. One trap, with its buried log, she might have dragged. With two, she was helpless. 
struggle as she might, it only worked those relentless jaws more deeply into her feet. She snapped wildly at the air. She tore the dead hawk into shreds. She roared the short, barking roar of a crazy wolf. She bit at the traps, at her cub, at herself. She tore her legs that were held. She gnawed in a frenzy at her flank. She chopped off her tail in her madness. She splintered all her teeth on the steel and filled her bleeding, foaming jaws with clay and sand. She struggled till she fell and writhed about or lay like dead, till strong enough to rise and grind the chains against her teeth. And so the night passed by. And Dusky Mane? Where was he? The feeling of the time when his foster mother had come home poisoned now returned. But he was even more afraid of her. She seemed filled with fighting hate. He held away and whined a little. He slunk off and came back when she lay still, only to retreat again as she sprang forward, raging at him, and then renewed her efforts on the traps. He did not understand it, but he knew this much. She was in terrible trouble and the cause seemed to be the same as that which scared them the night they had ventured near the calf. Dusky Mane hung about all night, fearing to go near, not knowing what to do, and helpless as his mother. At dawn the next day, a shepherder seeking lost sheep discovered her from a neighboring hill. A signal mirror called the wolfer from his camp. Dusky Mane saw the new danger. He was a mere cub, though tall. He could not face the man, and fled at his approach. The wolver rode up to the sorry, tattered, bleeding she-wolf in the trap. He raised his rifle, and soon the struggling stopped. The wolver read the trail and the signs about and remembering those he had read before, he divined that this was the wolf with the great cub, the she-wolf of Sentinel Butte. Dusky Mane heard the crack as he scurried off into cover. He could scarcely know what it meant, but he never saw his kind old foster mother again. Henceforth, he must face the world alone. End of section six. Recording by Cooper Leaf. Section seven of Animal Heroes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cooper Leaf. Animal Heroes by Ernest Thompson Seaton. Chapter 7 The Young Wolf Wins a Place and Fame. Instinct is no doubt a wolf's first and best guide, but gifted parents are a great start in life. The dusky maned cub had had a mother of rare excellence and he reaped the advantage of all her cleverness. He had inherited an exquisite nose, and had absolute confidence in its admonitions. Mankind has difficulty in recognizing the power of nostrils. A gray wolf can glance over the morning wind as a man does over his newspaper, and get all the latest news. He can swing over the ground, and have the minutest information of every living creature that has walked there within many hours. His nose even tells which way it ran, and in a word, renders a statement of every animal that recently crossed his trail, whence it came, 
and whither it went. That power had dusky mane in the highest degree. His broad, moist nose was evidence of it to all who are judges of such things. Added to this, his frame was of unusual power and endurance. And last, he had early learned a deep distrust of everything strange, and call it what we will, shyness, wariness, or suspicion, it was worth more to him than all his cleverness. It was this as much as his physical powers that made a success of his life. Might is right in Wolfland, and Dusky Maine and his mother had been driven out of Sentinel Butte, but it was very delectable land, and he kept drifting back to his native mountain. One or two big wolves there resented his coming. They drove him off several times, yet each time he returned he was better able to face them. And before he was eighteen months old, he had defeated all rivals and established himself again on his native ground, where, like a robber baron levying tribute on the rich lands about him and finding safety in the rocky fastness. Wolver Rider often hunted in that country, and before long he came across a five-and-a-half-inch track, the footprint of a giant wolf. Roughly reckoned, twenty to twenty-five pounds of weight, or six inches of stature, is a fair allowance for each inch of a wolf's foot. This wolf, therefore, stood thirty-three inches at the shoulder, and weighed about one hundred and forty pounds, by far the largest wolf he had ever met. King had lived in goat country, and now in goat language he exclaimed, You bet! Ain't that an old billy! Thus, by trivial chance it was that Dusky Maine was known to his foe as Badlands Billy. Ryder was familiar with the muster call of wolves, the long, smooth cry. But Billy's had a singular feature, a slurring that was always distinctive. Ryder had heard this before in the Cottonwood Canyon. And when at length he got a sight of the big wolf with the black mane, it struck him that this was also the cub of the old yellow fury that he had trapped. These were among the things he told me as we sat by the fire at night. I knew of the early days when anyone could trap or poison wolves, of the passing of those days with the passing of the simple wolves, of the new race of wolves, with new cunning that were defying the methods of the ranchmen and increasing steadily in numbers. Now the wolver told me of the various ventures that Penroof had made with different kinds of hounds, of foxhounds, too thin-skinned to fight, of greyhounds that were useless when the animal was out of sight, of Danes, too heavy for the rough country, and last, of the composite pack, with some of all kinds, including at times a bull terrier, to lead them in the final fight. He told of hunts after coyotes, which usually were successful because the coyotes sought the plains and were easily caught by the greyhounds. He told of killing some small gray wolves with this very pack, usually at the cost of the one that led them. But above all, he dwelt on the wonderful prowess of that there cursed old black wolf of Sentinel Butte, and related the many attempts to run him down or corner him, an unbroken array of failures. 
for the big wolf, with exasperating persistence, continued to live on the finest stock of the Penroof brand, and each year was teaching more wolves how to do the same with perfect impunity. I listened even as gold hunters listen to stories of treasure trove, for these were the things of my world. These things indeed were uppermost in all our minds, for the Penroof pack was lying around our campfire now. We were out after Badlands, Billy. Chapter 8 The Voice in the Night and the Big Track in the Morning One night late in September, after the last streak of light was gone from the west, and the coyotes had begun their yapping chorus, a deep, booming sound was heard. King took out his pipe, turned his head, and said, That's him. That's old Billy. He's been watching us all day from some high place. And now, when the guns are useless, he's here to have a little fun with us. Two or three dogs arose with bristling manes, for they clearly recognized that this was no coyote. They rushed out into the night, but did not go far. Their brawling sounds were suddenly varied by loud yelps, and they came running back to the shelter of the fire. One was so badly cut in the shoulder that he was useless for the rest of the hunt. Another was hurt in the flank. It seemed the less serious wound, and yet next morning the hunters buried that second dog. The men were furious. They vowed speedy vengeance, and at dawn were off on the trail. The coyotes yelped their dawning song, but they melted into the hills when the light was strong. The hunters searched about for the big wolf's track, hoping that the hounds would be able to take it up and find him. But they either could not or would not. They found a coyote, however, and within a few hundred yards they killed him. It was a victory, I suppose, for coyotes kill calves and sheep. But somehow, I felt the common thought of all. Mighty brave dogs for a little coyote, but they could not face the big wolf last night. Young Penroof, as though in answer to one of the unput questions, said, Say, boys, I believe old Billy had a whole bunch of wolves with him last night. Didn't see but one track, said King gruffly. In this way, the whole of October slipped by. All day hard riding about doubtful trails, following the dogs who either could not keep the trail or feared to do so, and again and again we had news of damage done by the wolf. Sometimes a cowboy would report it to us, and sometimes we found the carcasses ourselves. A few of these we poisoned, though it is considered a very dangerous thing to do while running dogs. The end of the month found us a weather-beaten, dispirited lot of men, with a worn-out lot of horses, and a foot-sore pack, reduced in numbers from ten to seven. So far we had only killed one gray wolf and three coyotes. Badlands Billy had killed at least a dozen cows and dogs at fifty dollars a head. Some of the boys had decided to give it up and go home. So King took advantage of their going to send a letter asking for reinforcements, including all the spare dogs at the ranch. During the two days' wait, we rested our horses, 
shot some game, and prepared for that harder hunt. Late on the second day, the new dogs arrived. Eight beauties, and raised the working pack to fifteen. The weather now turned much cooler, and in the morning, to the joy of wolvers, the ground was white with snow. This surely meant success. With cool weather for the dogs and horses to run, with the big wolf not far away, for he had been heard the night before, and with tracking snow so that once found he could not baffle us, escape for him was impossible. We were up at dawn, but before we could get away, three men came riding into camp. They were Penroof's boys back again. The change of weather had changed their minds. They knew that with snow we might have luck. Remember now, said King, as all were mounting, we don't want any but Badlands Billy this trip. Get him, and we can bust up the whole combination. It is a five-and-a-half-inch track. And each measured off on his quirt handle or on his glove the exact five-and-a-half inches that was to be used in testing the tracks he might find. Not more than an hour had elapsed before we got a signal from the rider who had gone westward. One shot, that means attention. A pause while counting ten. Then two shots, that means come on. King gathered the dogs and rode direct to the distant figure on the hill. All hearts beat high with hope, and we were not disappointed. Some small wolf tracks had been found, but here at last was the big track, nearly six inches long. Young Penroof wanted to yell and set out at a full gallop. It was like hunting a lion. It was like finding happiness long deferred. The hunter knows nothing more inspiring than the clean-cut line of fresh tracks that is leading to a wonderful animal he has long been hunting in vain. How King's eyes gleamed as he gloated over that sign. Chapter 9 Run Down at Last It was the roughest of all rough riding. It was a far longer hunt than we had expected, and was full of little incidents. For that endless line of marks was a minute history of all that the big wolf had done the night before. Here he had circled at the telephone box and looked for news. There he had paused to examine an old skull. Here he had shied off and swung cautiously upwind to examine something that proved to be an old tin can. There, at length, he had mounted a low hill and sat down, probably giving the muster howl, for two wolves had come to him from different directions. And they then had descended to the river flat, where the cattle would seek shelter during the storm. Here, all three had visited a buffalo skull. There, they trotted in a line. And yonder they separated, going three different ways. To meet, yes, here. Oh, what a sight! A fine cow ripped open, left dead and uneaten. Not to their taste, it seems. For see, within a mile is another killed by them. Not six hours ago they had feasted. Here their trails scatter again, but not far, and the snow plainly tells how each had lain down to sleep. The hound's manes bristled as they snipped those places. King had held the dogs well in hand, 
but now they were greatly excited. We came to a hill whereon the wolves had turned and faced our way, until they fled at full speed, so said the trail. And now it was clear that they had watched us from that hill, and were not far away. The pack kept Will together, because the greyhounds, seeing no quarry, were merely puttering around among the other dogs or running back with the horses. We went as fast as we could, for the wolves were speeding. Up Mesa and down Cooley we rode, sticking closely to the dogs, though it was the roughest country that could be picked. One gully after another, an hour and another hour, and still the threefold track went bounding on. Another hour, and no change, but interminable climbing, sliding, struggling, through bush and over boulder, guided by the faraway yelping of the dogs. Now the chase led down to the low valley of the river, where there was scarcely any snow. Jumping and scrambling down hills, recklessly leaping dangerous gullies and slippery rocks, we felt that we could not hold out much longer. When on the lowest, driest level, the pack split. Some went up, some went down, and others straight on. Oh, how King did swear! He knew at once what it meant. The wolves had scattered and so divided the pack. Three dogs after a wolf would have no chance. Four could not kill him. Two would certainly be killed. And yet this was the first encouraging sign we had seen for it meant that the wolves were hard-pressed. We spurred ahead to stop the dogs, to pick for them the only trail. But that was not so easy. Without snow here and with countless dog tracks, we were foiled. All we could do was let the dogs choose, but keep them to a single choice. Away we went as before, hoping yet fearing that we were not on the right track. The dogs ran well, very fast indeed. This was a bad sign, King said, but we could not get sight of the track because the dogs overran it before we came. After a two-mile run, the chase led upward again in snow country. The wolf was sighted, but to our disgust we were on the track of the smallest one. I thought so, growled young Penroof. Dogs was altogether too keen for a serious proposition. Kind of surprised it ain't turned out to be a jackrabbit. Within another mile he had turned to bay in a willow thicket. We heard him howl the long-drawn howl for help, and before we could reach the place King saw the dogs recoil and scatter. A minute later there sped from the far side of the thicket a small gray wolf and a black one of much greater size. By golly, if he didn't yell for help and Billy come back to help him, that's great exclaimed the wolver, and my heart went out to the brave old wolf that refused to escape by abandoning his friend. The next hour was a hard repetition of the gully riding, but it was on the highlands where there was snow, and when again the pack split, we strained every power and succeeded in keeping them on the big 550 track that already was wearing for me the glamour of romance. Evidently the dogs preferred either of the others, but 
but we got them going at last. Another half hour's hard work, and far ahead as I rose to a broad, flat plain, I had my first glimpse of the big black wolf of Sentinel Butte. Hurrah! Badlands Billy! Hurrah! Badlands Billy! I shouted in salute, and the others looked up at the cry. We were on his track at last, thanks to himself. The dogs joined in with a louder baying. The greyhounds yelped and made straight for him. The horses sniffed and sprang more gamely as they caught the thrill. The only silent one was the black maned wolf, and as I marked his size and power, and above all his long and massive jaws, I knew why the dogs preferred some other trail. With head and tail low, he was bounding over the snow. His tongue was lolling long. Plainly he was hard-pressed. The wolver's hands flew to the revolvers. Though he was three hundred yards ahead, they were out for blood, not sport. But an instant later, he had sunk from view in the nearest sheltered canyon. Now which way would he go? Up or down the canyon? Up was to the mountain. Down was better cover. King and I thought up, so pressed westward along the ridge. But the others rode eastward, watching for a chance to shoot. Soon we had ridden out of hearing. We were wrong. The wolf had gone down, but we heard no shooting. The canyon was crossable here. We reached the other side and then turned back at a gallop, scanning the snow for a trail, the hills for a moving form, or the wind for a sound of life. Squeak, squeak went our leather saddles. Puff, puff, our horses. And their feet, kekalum, kekalum. Chapter 10 When Billy Went Back to His Mountain We were back opposite to where the wolf had plunged, but saw no sign. We rode at an easy gallop, on eastward, a mile, and still on. When King gasped out, Look at that! A dark spot was moving on the snow ahead. We put on speed. Another dark spot appeared, and another, but they were not going fast. In five minutes we were near them, to find three of our own greyhounds. They had lost sight of the game, and with that their interest waned. Now they were seeking us. We saw nothing there of the chase or of the other hunters. But hastening to the next ridge, we stumbled on the trail we sought, and followed as hard as though in view. Another canyon came in our path, and as we rode and looked for a place to cross, a wild din of hounds came from its brushy depth. The clamor grew and passed up the middle. We raced along the rim, hoping to see the game. The dogs appeared near the farther side, not in a pack, but in a long, straggling line. In five minutes more they rose to the edge, and ahead of them was the great black wolf. He was loping as before, head and tail low. Power was plain in every limb, and double power in his jaws and neck. But I thought his bounds were shorter now, 
and that they had lost their spring. The dogs slowly reached the upper level, and sighting him they broke into a feeble cry. They too were nearly spent. The greyhounds saw the chase, and leaving us they scrambled down the canyon and up the other side at impetuous speed that would surely break them down. While we rode, vainly seeking means of crossing. How the wolver raved to see the pack lead off in the climax of the chase and himself held up behind. But he rode and raved, and still rode, up to where the canyon dwindled, rough land and a hard ride. As we neared the great flat mountain, the feeble cry of the pack was heard again from the south. Then, toward the high butte side, and just a trifle louder now, we reined in on a hillock and scanned the snow. A moving speck appeared, then others, not bunched, but in a straggling train, and at times there was a far faint cry. They were headed toward us. Coming on. Yes, coming. But so slowly, for not one was really running now. There was the grim old cow killer limping over the ground, and far behind a greyhound and another, and farther still the other dogs, in order of their speed, slowly, gamely, dragging themselves on that pursuit. Many hours of the hardest toil had done their work. The wolf had vainly sought to fling them off. Now was his hour of doom for he was spent. They still had some reserve. Straight to us for a time they came, skirting the base of the mountain, crawling. We could not cross to join them, so held our breath and gazed with ravenous eyes. They were nearer now, the wind brought feeble notes from the hounds. The big wolf turned to the steep ascent. Up a well-known trail, it seemed, for he made no slip. My heart went with him, for he had come back to rescue his friend. And a momentary thrill of pity came over both of us as we saw him glance around and drag himself up the sloping way to die on his mountain. There was no escape for him. Beset by fifteen dogs with men to back them, he was not walking but tottering upward. The dogs behind in line were now doing a little better, were nearing him. We could hear them gasping, we scarcely heard them bay, they had no breath for that. Upward the grim procession went, circling a spur of the butte and along a ledge that climbed and narrowed, then dropped for a few yards to a shelf that reared above the canyon. The foremost dogs were closing, fearless of a foe so nearly spent. Here, in the narrowest place. Here, one wrong step meant death. The great wolf turned and faced them. With four feet braced, with head low and tail a little raised, his dusky mane of bristling, his glittering tusks laid bare but uttering no sound that we could hear. He faced the crew. His legs were weak with toil, but his neck 
his jaws, and his heart were strong. And now, all you who love the dogs had better close the book. On up and down, fifteen to one they came. The swiftest first, and how it was done the eye could scarcely see. But even as a stream of water pours on a rock to be splashed in broken jets aside, that stream of dogs came pouring down the path in single file perforce, and Dusky Mane received them as they came. A feeble spring, a counter lunge, a gash, and Fango's down, has lost his foothold and is gone. Dander and Coley close and try to cinch. A rush, a heave, and they are fallen from that narrow path. Blue spot then, backed by mighty Oscar and fearless Tig. But the wolf is next the rock, and the flash of combat clears to show him there alone. The big dog's gone, the rest close in. The hindmost force the foremost on, down to their death. Slash, chop, and heave, from the swiftest to the biggest to the last. Down, down he sent them, whirling from the ledge to the gaping gulch below, where rocks and snags of trunks were sharp to do their work. In fifty seconds, it was done. The rock had splashed the stream aside. The pent-roof pack was all wiped out, and Badlands Billy stood there, alone again on his mountain. A moment he waited to look for more to come, there were no more. The pack was dead. But waiting, he got his breath. Then raising his voice for the first time in that fatal scene, he feebly gave a long yell of triumph. And scaling the next low bank, was screened from view in a canyon of Sentinel Butte. We stared like men of stone. The guns in our hands were forgotten. It was all so quick, so final. We made no move till the wolf was gone. It was not far to the place. We went on foot to see if any had escaped. Not one was left alive. We could do nothing. We could say nothing. Chapter 11 The Howl at Sunset A week later we were riding the upper trail back of the chimney pot, King and I. The old man is pretty sick of it, he said. He'd sell out if he could. He don't know what's the next move. The sun went down beyond Sentinel Butte. It was dusk as we reached the turn that led to Dumont's place, and a deep-toned rolling howl came from the river flat below, followed by a number of higher-pitched howls in an answering chorus. We could see nothing, but we listened hard. The song was repeated, the hunting cry of the wolves. It faded. The night was stirred by another, the sharp bark and the short howl. The signal, close in. A bellow came up, very short, for it was cut short, and King, as he touched his horse, said grimly, that's him. He's out with the pack. 
And there goes another beef. End of section 7. Recording by Cooper Leaf. Section 8 of Animal Heroes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Baker. Animal Heroes by Ernest Thompson Seton. The Boy and the Lynx. Chapter 1 The Boy. He was barely fifteen a lover of sport and uncommonly keen even for a beginner flocks of wild pigeons had been coming all day across the blue lake of kaigianau and perching in line on the dead limbs of the great rampikes that stood as monuments of fire around the little clearing in the forest they afforded tempting marks but he followed them for hours in vain they seemed to know the exact range of the old-fashioned gun and rose on noisy wings each time before he was near enough to fire. At length a small flock scattered among the low green trees that grew about the spring near the log shanty, and taking advantage of the cover, Thorburn went in gently. He caught sight of a single pigeon close to him, took a long aim, and fired. A sharp crack resounded at almost the same time, and the bird fell dead, Thorburn rushed to seize the prize just as a tall young man stepped into view and picked it up. Hello, Corny, you got my bird. Your bird. Sure yours flew away there. I saw them settle higher and thought I'd make sure of one with a rifle. A careful examination showed that a rifle ball as well as a charge of shot had struck the pigeon. The gunners had fired on the same bird. Both enjoyed the joke though it had its serious side, for food as well as ammunition was scarce in that backwoods home. Corny, a superb specimen of a six-foot Irish-Canadian in early manhood, now led away to the log shanty where the very scarcity of luxuries and the roughness of their lives were sources of merriment, for the colts, though born and bred in the backwoods of Canada, had lost nothing of the spirit that makes the Irish blood a worldwide synonym of hardiness and wit. Corney was the eldest son of a large family. The old folks lived at Petersay, twenty-five miles to the southward. He had taken up a claim to carve his own home out of the woods at Fenabank, and his grown sisters, Margat, staid and reliable, and Lou, bright and witty, were keeping house for him. Thorburn Alder was visiting them. He had just recovered from a severe illness and had been sent to rough it in the woods in hope of winning some of the vigor of his hosts. Their home was of unhewn logs, unfloored and roofed with sods, which bore a luxuriant crop of grass and weeds. The primitive woods around were broken in two places. One, where the roughest of roads led southward to Petersay, the other where the sparkling lake rolled on a pebbly shore and gave a glimpse of their nearest neighbor's house four miles across the water. Their daily round had little change. Corney was up at daybreak to light the fire, call his sisters, and feed the horses while they prepared breakfast. At six the meal was over and Corney went to his work. At noon, which Margat knew by the shadow of a certain rampike falling on the spring, a clear notification to draw fresh water for the table, Lou would hang a white rag on a pole, and Corney, seeing the signal, would return from summer fallow or hayfield, grimy, swarthy, and ruddy, a picture of manly vigor and honest toil. Thor might be away all day, but at night, when they again assembled at the table, he would come from lake or distant ridge and eat a supper like the dinner and breakfast, for meals as well as days were exact repeats. Pork, bread, potatoes, and tea, with occasionally eggs supplied by a dozen hens around the little log stable, with 
rarely a variation of wild meat, for Thor was not a hunter, and Corney had little time for anything but the farm. Chapter 2 The Lynx A huge four-foot bassword had gone the way of all trees. Death had been generous, had sent the three warnings. It was the biggest of its kind. Its children were grown up. It was hollow. The wintry blast that sent it down had broken it across and revealed a great hole where should have been its heart. A long wooden cavern in the middle of a sunny opening now lay and presented an ideal home for a lynx when she sought a sheltered nesting place for her coming brood. Old was she and gaunt, for this was a year of hard times for the lynxes. A rabbit plague the autumn before had swept away their main support. A winter of deep snow and sudden crusts had killed off nearly all the partridges. A long, wet spring had destroyed the few growing coveys and kept the ponds and streams so full that fish and frogs were safe from their armed paws, and this mother lynx fared no better than her kind. The little ones, half starved before they came, were a double drain, for they took the time she might have spent in hunting. The northern hare is the favorite food of the lynx, and in some years she could have killed fifty in one day, but never one did she see this season. The plague had done its work too well. One day she caught a red squirrel which had run into a hollow log that proved a trap. Another day a fetid black snake was her only food. A day missed, and the large ones whined piteously for their natural food and failing drink. One day she saw a large black animal of unpleasant but familiar smell. Swiftly and silently she sprang to make attack. She struck it once on the nose, but the porcupine doubled his head under, his tail flew up, and the mother lynx was speared in a dozen places with the little stinging javelins. She drew them all with her teeth, for she had learned porcupine years before, and only the harsh push of want would have made her strike one now. A frog was all she caught that day. On the next, as she ranged the farthest woods, in a long, hard hunt, she heard a singular calling voice. It was new to her. She approached it cautiously, upwind, got many new odors and some more strange sounds in coming. The loud, clear, rolling call was repeated as the mother lynx came to an opening in the forest. In the middle of it were two enormous muskrat or beaver houses, far bigger than the biggest she ever before had seen. They were made partly of logs and situated not in a pond, but on a dry knoll. Walking about them were a number of partridges, that is, birds like partridges, only larger and of various colors, red, yellow, and white. She quivered with the excitement that in a man would have been called buck fever. Food! food, abundance of food, and the old huntress sank to earth. Her breast was on the ground, her elbows above her back as she made stock, her shrewdest, subtlest stock. One of those partridges she must have at any price. No trick now must go untried, no error in this hunt. If it took hours, all day, she must approach with certainty to win before the quarry took flight. Only a few bounds it was from wood shelter to the great rat house, but she was an hour in crawling that small space, from stump to brush, from log to bunch of grass. She sneaked, a flattened form, and the partridges saw her not. They fed about, the biggest uttering the ringing call that first had fallen on her ear. Once they seemed to sense their peril, but a long wait dispelled the fear. Now they were almost in reach, and she trembled with all the eagerness of the hunting heart and the hungry maw. Her eyes centered on a white one, not the nearest, 
but the color seemed to hold her gaze. There was an open space around the rat house. Outside that were tall weeds and stumps were scattered everywhere. The white bird wandered behind these weeds. The red one of the loud voice flew to the top of the rat mound and sang as before. The mother lynx sank lower yet. It seemed an alarm note, but no, the white one still was there. She could see its feathers gleaming through the weeds. An open space now lay about. The huntress, flattened like an empty skin, trailed slow and silent on the ground behind the log no thicker than her neck. If she could reach that tuft of brush, she could get unseen to the woods, and then would be near enough to spring. She could smell them now the rich and potent smell of life, of flesh and blood that set her limbs a-tingle and her eyes a-glow. The partridges still scratched and fed. Another flew to the high top, but the white one remained. Five more slow, gliding, silent steps, and the lynx was behind the weeds, the white bird shining through. She gauged the distance, tried the footing, swung her hind legs to clear some fallen brush, then leaped direct with all her force, and the white one never knew the death it died, for the fateful gray shadow dropped, the swift and deadly did their work, and before the other birds could realize the foe or fly, the lynx was gone, with the white bird squirming in her jaws." Uttering an unnecessary growl of inborn furiosity and joy, she bounded into the forest and bee-like sped for home. The last quiver had gone from the warm body of the victim when she heard the sound of heavy feet ahead. She leaped on a log. The wings of her prey were muffling her eyes, so she laid the bird down and held it safely with one paw. The sound drew nearer. The bushes bent and a boy stepped into view. The old lynx knew and hated his kind. She had watched them at night, had followed them, had been hunted and hurt by them. For a moment they stood face to face. The huntress growled a warning that was also a challenge and a defiance, picked up the bird, and bounded from the log into the sheltering bushes. It was a mile or two to the den, but she stayed not to eat till the sunlit opening and the big basswood came to view. Then a low purr called forth the little ones to revel with their mother in a plenteous meal of the choicest food. End of section 8、section、nine、of Animal Heroes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Baker. Animal Heroes by Ernest Thompson Seaton. The Boy and the Lynx. Chapter Three The Home of the Lynx. At first, Thor, being town bred, was timid about venturing into the woods beyond the sound of Corny's axe. But day by day he went farther, guiding himself not by unreliable moss on trees, but by sun, compass, and landscape features. His purpose was to learn about the wild animals rather than to kill them. But the naturalist is close kin to the sportsman, and the gun was his constant companion. In the clearing, the only animal of any size was a fat woodchuck. It had a hole under a stump some hundred yards from the shanty. On Sunday mornings it used to lie basking on the stump, but eternal vigilance is the pride of every good thing in the woods. The woodchuck was always alert, and Thor tried in vain to shoot or even to trap him. Here, said Corny one morning, time we had some fresh meat. He took down his rifle, an old-fashioned brass-mounted small bore, and loaded with care that showed the true rifleman. He steadied the weapon against the door jamb and fired. 
the woodchuck fell backward and lay still. Thor raced to the place and returned in triumph with the animal, shouting, Plumb through the head, one hundred and twenty yards! Corny controlled the gratified smile that wrestled with the corners of his mouth, but his bright eyes shone a trifle brighter for the moment. It was no mere killing for killing's sake, for the woodchuck was spreading a belt of destruction in the crop around his den. Its flesh supplied the family with more than one good meal, and Corny showed Thor how to use the skin. First, the pelt was wrapped in hardwood ashes for twenty-four hours. This brought the hair off. Then the skin was soaked for three days in soft soap and worked by hand as it dried till it came out a white, strong leather. Thor's wanderings extended farther in search of the things which always came as surprises, however much he was looking for them. Many days were blanks, and others would be crowded with incidents, for unexpectedness is above all the peculiar feature of hunting and its lasting charm. One day he had gone far beyond the ridge in a new direction and passed through an open glade where lay the broken trunk of a huge basswood. The size impressed it on his memory. He swung past the glade to make for the lake, a mile to the west, and twenty minutes later he started back as his eyes rested on a huge black animal in the crotch of a hemlock, some thirty feet from the ground. A bear! At last! This was the test of nerve he had half expected all summer, had been wondering how that mystery himself would act under this very trial. He stood still, his right hand dived into his pocket, and, bringing out three or four buckshot, which he carried for emergency, dropped them on top of the birdshot already in the gun, then rammed a wad to hold them down. The bear had not moved, and the boy could not see its head, but now he studied it carefully. It was not such a large one. No, it was a small one. Yes, very small. A cub. A cub? That meant a mother bear at hand, and Thor looked about with some fear. But seeing no signs of any except the little one, he leveled the gun and fired. Then, to his surprise, down crashed the animal quite dead. It was not a bear, but a large porcupine. As it lay there, he examined it with wonder and regret, for he had no wish to kill such a harmless creature. On its grotesque face he found two or three long scratches, which proved that he had not been its only enemy. As he turned away he noticed some blood on his trousers, then saw that his left hand was bleeding. He had wounded himself quite severely on the quills of the animal without knowing it. He was sorry to leave the specimen there, and Lou, when she learned of it, said it was a shame not to skin it when she— needed a fur-lined cape for the winter. On another day Thor had gone without a gun, as he meant only to gather some curious plants he had seen. They were close to the clearing. He knew the place by a fallen elm. As he came to it he heard a peculiar sound. Then, on the log, his eye caught two moving things. He lifted a bough and got a clear view. They were the head and tail of an enormous lynx. It had seen him and was glaring and grumbling, and under its foot on the log was a white bird that a second glance showed to be one of their own precious hens. How fierce and cruel the brute looked! How Thor hated it, and fairly gnashed his teeth with disgust that now, when his greatest chance was come, he for once was without his gun. He was in not a little fear, too, and stood wondering what to do. The lynx growled louder, its stumpy tail twitched viciously for a minute. Then it picked up its victim, and leaping from the log was lost to view. As it was a very rainy summer, the ground was soft everywhere, and the young hunter was led to follow tracks that would have despised an expert in drier times. One day he came on pig-like footprints in the woods. 
He followed them with little difficulty, for they were new, and a heavy rain two hours before had washed out all other trails. After about half a mile they led him to an open ravine, and as he reached its brow he saw across it a flash of white. Then his keen young eyes made out the forms of a deer and a spotted fawn gazing at him curiously. Though on their trail he was not a little startled, he gazed at them open-mouthed. The mother turned and raised the danger flag, her white tail, and bounded lightly away to be followed by the youngster, clearing low branches with an effortless leap, or bending down with cat-like suppleness when they came to a log upraised so that they might pass below. He never got a chance to shoot at them, though more than once he saw the same two tracks, or believed they were the same, as, for some cause never yet explained, deer were scarcer in that unbroken forest than they were in later years when clearings spread around. He never again saw them, but he saw the mother once. He thought it was the same. She was searching the woods with her nose, trying the ground for trails. She was nervous and anxious, evidently seeking. Thor remembered a trick that Corney had told him. He gently stooped, took up a broad blade of grass, laid it between the edges of his thumbs. Then, blowing through this simple squeaker, he made a short, shrill bleat, a fair imitation of a fawn's cry for the mother, and the deer, though a long way off, came bounding toward him. He snatched his gun, meaning to kill her, but the movement caught her eye. She stopped. Her mane bristled a little. She sniffed and looked inquiringly at him. Her big, soft eyes touched his heart, held back his hand. She took a cautious step nearer, got a full whiff of her mortal enemy, bounded behind a big tree and away before his merciful impulse was gone. "'Poor thing,' said Thor. "'I believe she has lost her little one.' Yet once more the boy met a lynx in the woods. Half an hour after seeing the lonely deer, he crossed the long ridge that lay some miles north of the shanty. He had passed the glade where the great basswood lay when a creature like a big bob-tailed kitten appeared and looked innocently at him. His gun went up as usual, but the kitten merely cocked its head on one side and fearlessly surveyed him. Then a second one that he had not noticed before began to play with the first pawing at its tail, and inviting its brother to tussle. Thor's first thought to shoot was stayed as he watched their gambols, but the remembrance of his feud with their race came back. He had almost raised the gun when a fierce rumble close at hand gave him a start, and there, not ten feet from him, stood the old one, looking big and fierce as a tigress. It was surely folly to shoot the young ones now. The boy nervously dropped some buckshot on the charge, while the snarling growl rose and fell, but before he was ready to shoot at her, the old one had picked up something that was by her feet. The boy got a glimpse of rich brown and white spots, the limp form of a newly killed fawn. Then she passed out of sight. The kittens followed, and he saw her no more until the time when— Life against life, they were weighed in the balance together. Chapter 4 The Terror of the Woods Six weeks had passed in daily routine when one day the young giant seemed unusually quiet as he went about. His handsome face was very sober, and he sang not at all that morning. He and Thor slept on a hay bunk in one corner of the main room, and that night the boy awakened more than once to hear his companion groaning and tossing in his sleep. Corney arose as usual in the morning and fed the horses, but lay down again while the sisters got breakfast. He roused himself by an effort and went back to work, but came home early. He was trembling from head to foot. It was hot summer weather, but he could not be kept warm. After several hours a reaction set in, and Corney was in a high fever. 
The family knew well now that he had the dreaded chills and fever of the backwoods. Margaret went out and gathered a handful of pipsissawa to make tea, of which Corney was encouraged to drink copiously. But in spite of all their herbs and nursing, the young man got worse. At the end of ten days he was greatly reduced in flesh and incapable of work. So on one of the well days that are usual in the course of the disease, he said, "'Say, girls, I can't stand it no longer. Guess I better go home. I'm well enough to drive today, for a while, anyway. If I'm took down, I'll lay in the wagon, and the horses will fetch me home. Mother'll have me all right in a week or so. If you run out of grub before I come back, take the canoe to Ellerton's.' So the girls fastened the horses, the wagon was partly filled with hay, and Corney, weak and white-faced, drove away on the long rough road and left them feeling much as though they were on a desert island and their only boat had been taken from them. Half a week had scarcely gone before all three of them, Margat, Lou, and Thor, were taken down with a yet more virulent form of chills and fever. Corney had had every other a well day, but with these three there were no well days, and the house became an abode of misery. Seven days passed, and now Margat could not leave her bed, and Lou was barely able to walk around the house. She was a brave girl with a fund of drollery which did much towards keeping up all their spirits, but her merriest jokes fell ghastly from her wan, pinched face. Thor, though weak and ill, was the strongest, and did for the others, cooking and serving each day a simple meal, for they could eat very little. Fortunately, perhaps, as there was very little, and Corney could not return for another week. Soon Thor was the only one able to rise, and one morning, when he dragged himself to cut the little usual slice of their treasured bacon, he found, to his horror, that the whole piece was gone. It had been stolen, doubtless, by some wild animal from the little box on the shady side of the house where it was kept safe from flies. Now they were down to flour and tea. He was in despair when his eye lighted on the chickens about the stable. But what's the use? In his feeble state he might as well try to catch a deer or a hawk. Suddenly he remembered his gun, and very soon was preparing a fat hen for the pot. He boiled it whole as the easiest way to cook it, and the broth was the first really tempting food they had had for some time. They kept alive for three wretched days on that chicken, and when it was finished Thor again took down his gun it seemed a much heavier gun now. He crawled to the barn, but he was so weak and shaky that he missed several times before he brought down a fowl. Corney had taken the rifle away with him, and three charges of gun ammunition were all that now remained. Thor was surprised to see how few hens there were now, only three or four. There used to be over a dozen. Three days later he made another raid, he saw but one hen, and he used up his last ammunition to get that. His daily routine now was a monotony of horror. In the morning, which was his well time, he prepared a little food for the household, and got ready for the night of raging fever by putting a bucket of water on a block at the head of each bunk. About one o'clock, with fearful regularity, the chills would come on, with trembling from head to foot, and chattering teeth, and cold, cold, within and without. Nothing seemed to give any warmth. The fire seemed to have lost its power. There was nothing to do but to lie and shake, and suffer all the slow torture of freezing to death, and shaking to pieces. For six hours it would keep up, then to the torture nausea lent its horrid aid throughout. Then, about seven or eight o'clock in the evening, a change would come, a burning fever set in, no ice would have seemed cool to him then, 
water water was all he craved and drank and drank until three or four in the morning when the fever would abate and a sleep of total exhaustion followed if you run out of food take the canoe to ellerton's was the brother's last word who was to take the canoe there was but half a chicken now between them and starvation and no sign of corny for three interminable weeks the deadly program dragged along it went on the same yet worse as the sufferers grew weaker a few days more and the boy also would be unable to leave his couch then what despair was on the house and the silent cry of each was oh god will corny never come chapter five the home of the boy on the day of that last chicken thor was all morning carrying water enough for the coming three fevers the chill attacked him sooner than it was due and his fever was worse than ever before he drank deeply and often from the bucket at his head he had filled it and it was nearly emptied when about two in the morning the fever left him and he fell asleep in the gray dawn he was awakened by a curious sound not far away a splashing of water he turned his head to see two glaring eyes within a foot of his face a great beast lapping the water in the bucket by his bed thor gazed in horror for a moment then closed his eyes sure that he was dreaming certain that this was a nightmare of india with a tiger by his couch but the lapping continued he looked up yes it was still there he tried to find his voice but uttered only a gurgle the great furry head quivered the sniff came from below the shining eyeballs and the creature whatever it was dropped to its front feet and went across the hut under the table thor was fully awake now he rose slowly on his elbow and feebly shouted shy at which the shining eyes reappeared under the table and the gray form came forth calmly it walked across the ground and glided under the lowest log at a place where an old potato pit left an opening and disappeared what was it the sick boy hardly knew some savage beast of prey undoubtedly he was totally unnerved he shook with fear and a sense of helplessness and the night passed in fitful sleep and sudden starts awake to search the gloom again for those fearful eyes and the great gray gliding form in the morning he did not know whether it were not all a delirium yet he made a feeble effort to close the old cellar hole with some firewood the three had little appetite but even that they restrained since now they were down to part of a chicken and corny evidently he supposed they had been to ellerton's and got all the food they needed again that night when the fever left him weak and dozing thor was awakened by a noise in the room a sound of crunching bones he looked around to see dimly outlined against the little window the form of a large animal on the table thor shouted he tried to hurl his boot at the intruder it leaped lightly to the ground and passed out of the hole again wide open it was no dream this time he knew and the women knew it too not only had they heard the creature but the chicken the last of their food was wholly gone poor thor barely left his couch that day it needed all the querulous complaints of the sick women to drive him forth down by the spring he found a few berries and divided them with the others he made his usual preparation for the chills and the thirst but he added this by the side of his couch he put an old fish spear the only weapon he could find now the gun was useless a pine root candle and some matches he knew the beast was coming back again was coming hungry it would find no food what more natural he thought than take the living prey lying there so helpless 
and a vision came of the limp brown form of the little fawn borne off in those same cruel jaws. Once again he barricaded the hole with firewood, and the night passed as usual, but without any fierce visitor. Their food that day was flour and water, and to cook it Thor was forced to use some of his barricade. Lou attempted some feeble joke, guessed she was light enough to fly now and tried to rise, but she got no farther than the edge of the bunk. The same preparations were made and the night wore on, but early in the morning Thor was again awakened rudely by the sound of lapping water by his bed, and there, as before, were the glowing eyeballs, the great head, the gray form relieved by the dim light from the dawning window. Thor put all his strength into what was meant for a bold shout, but it was merely a feeble screech. He rose slowly and called out, Lou, Margat, the lynx, here's the lynx again. May God help you, for we can't, was the answer. Shy! Thor tried again to drive the beast away. It leaped onto the table by the window and stood up growling under the useless gun. Thor thought it was going to leap through the glass as it faced the window for a moment, but it turned and glared toward the boy, for he could see both eyes shining. He rose slowly to the side of his bunk and he prayed for help, for he felt it was kill or be killed. He struck a match and lighted his pine root candle, held that in his left hand and in his right took the old fish spear, meaning to fight. But he was so weak he had to use the fish spear as a crutch. The great beast stood on the table still, but was crouching a little as though for a spring. Its eyes glowed red in the torchlight. Its short tail was switching from side to side, and its growling took a higher pitch. Thor's knees were smiting together, but he leveled the spear and made a feeble lunge toward the brute. It sprang at the same moment, not at him, as he first thought. The torch in the boy's bold front had had effect. It went over his head to drop on the ground beyond, and at once to slink under the bunk. This was only a temporary repulse. Thor set the torch on a ledge of the logs, then took the spear in both hands. He was fighting for his life, and he knew it. He heard the voices of the women feebly praying. He saw only the glowing eyes under the bed and heard the growling in higher pitch as the beast was nearing action. He steadied himself by a great effort and plunged the spear with all the force he could give it. It struck something softer than the logs. A hideous snarl came forth. The boy threw all his weight on the weapon. The beast was struggling to get at him. He felt its teeth and claws grating on the handle, and in spite of himself it was coming on. Its powerful arms and claws were reaching for him now. He could not hold out long. He put on all his force, just a little more it was than before. The beast lurched. There was a growling, a crack, and a sudden yielding. The rotten old spearhead had broken off. The beast sprang out at him, past him, never touched him, but across through the hole and away, to be seen no more. Thor fell on the bed and lost all consciousness. He lay there, he knew not how long, but was awakened in broad daylight by a loud cheery voice. Hello, hello, are y'all dead? Lou? Thor, Margat. He had no strength to answer, but there was a trampling of horses outside, a heavy step, the door was forced open, and in strode Corney, handsome and hardy as ever. But what a flash of horror and pain came over his face on entering the silent shanty. Dead? he gasped. Who is dead? Where are you? Thor? Then, who is it? Lou? Margat? Corny. Corny came feebly from the bunk. There and there. They're awful sick. We have nothing to eat. 
"'Oh, what a fool I be!' said Corney again and again. "'I made sure you'd go to Ellerton's and get all ye wanted.' "'We had no chance, Corney. "'We were all three brought down at once, right after you left. "'Then the lynx came and cleared up the hens, and all in the house, too. "'Well, you got even with her.' "'And Corney pointed to the trail of blood across the mud floor and out under the logs.' Good food, nursing, and medicine restored them all. A month or two later, when the women wanted a new leaching barrel, Thor said, I know where there is a hollow basswood as big as a hogshead. He and Corney went to the place, and when they cut off what they needed, they found in the far end of it the dried-up bodies of two little lynxes with that of the mother, and in the side of the old one was the head of a fish spear, broken from the handle. End of section 9